All righty, y'all can go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. We're going to be in a few places today, but if you stay there, you'll be okay. I like to turn there with y'all. That way we're all on the same page and same speed. And yes, you see the title up there. I did actually submit that as my sermon title, New Year, New Me. Uh, So some of y'all are cringing as you read that. Uh, I'm sorry. Hopefully it helps it stick with you. Uh, For the rest of y'all that don't understand what's so cringeworthy about that, I'm sorry. You're the ones that we're probably embarrassed about in public. But around this time of year, a lot of people begin making New Year's resolutions, and they're almost always like food or fitness oriented. And some people make resolutions like, starting January 1st, uh, I'm going to limit myself to four donuts on Sunday mornings. Or uh, starting next year, I'm going to do at least two push-ups a day. Or uh, next year, I plan on drinking at least a gallon of water. And like... These are uh, my kind of resolutions. I'm not saying those are my exact resolutions, but these are kind of my category of resolution. Uh, I I was talking to Josh, and I think I remember Pastor Jason infamously uh, making a New Year's resolution a few years back. Uh, This resolution that he would follow through with next year's resolution a year in advance. Uh, And I searched all of his sermons on YouTube, but it appears he scrubbed it from the records. Uh, so I don't even know if you followed through with it. It's been, it was 365 days that you got to take a break on that. But that's a, that's a whole other level right there. Some people uh, establish pretty solid, reasonable uh, resolutions. Next year, I'm not going to eat any fast food. Or I plan on running seven miles a week. Or I want to lose four pounds a month. Or I want to read the Bible all the way through this year. And these are awesome and even pretty feasible for a lot of people. And then you have those people that are like, this year I am running the Boston Marathon. And I'm reading through the Bible uh, completely every week. And I'm only going to eat what I grow in my garden. And I'm going to learn Greek and Hebrew. Uh, And these are insane people. They're not humans. They're robots. Uh, But all three categories of people, uh, the low bar setters like me and Jason and then the realistic bar setters, and then those crazy overachievers all have one thing in common. It's that uh, they all start on January 1st. And I know it's pretty apparent why we start on January 1st. Like our calendar changes. It's the start of something new. It's an easy way to keep track of how many days you've been doing something. New year, new me, right? Half of y'all are now changing your Facebook status and deleting that. But why do we wait until January 1st to begin our resolutions? Like, if we know that these goals that we set make us better people, then why don't we just start them, like, right now? And I don't mean right now as in January 2nd or, like, January 1st. I'm talking about, like, right now. Like, the moment we realize something needs to change in our life, why don't we just change it? And if you're like me, you probably realize that there are things that needed to change months in advance, things You needed to change before we even got into December, before we even got into November. But if you're like me, you wait until January 1st to start on them. And you might start really strong too. But then when you burn out or you fail to meet your goal, or you're like, well, you know, there's always next year. You know, I made it 10 days without eating seven donuts. Well, there's always next year. And you give up until next year and you repeat the cycle all over again. And so this morning, I only ate one donut over in the youth room. You can go over there and count the missing donuts from the box. Only one donut. So y'all should be pretty proud of me. And if I kept this up for the next few weeks, that would be really impressive. But if on the fifth Sunday, I accidentally ate five donuts, I would probably just give up. And I would continue to devour five or six or seven donuts every single Sunday until January 1st. 2023. And so, yeah, we might say like, new year, new me, but we're still the same person. We're still the same donut-devouring, couch-sitting person we were 
on December 31st. Like the calendar changed, but our identity and our character, our habits, our behaviors, and ultimately our desires did not change. Who we are did not change. And so we either beat ourselves up over these failures, or we just simply accept them as being a part of who we are. That's just who I am. I'm a donut eater. Can't be anything else. And so at this point, I'm probably sounding like uh, that motivational speaker on Instagram or the TV preacher or the self-help speakers of the world, like literally cringing as I'm saying, new year, new me. And hopefully this cringiness helps it stick with you. You're going to remember it. That was a horrible sermon title. I'm never going to forget that. But in reflecting upon this time of making New Year's resolutions and subsequently failing New Year's resolutions, I really thought about the spiritual parallels that are there. Like how many times do we commit a sin over and over and we vow to change? We say like, I'll never do that again. And then we just end up doing it in due time. And we either beat ourselves up over it and wallow in the shame of our sin or we just become numb to it and we accept it as the thing the way things are always going to be that's just who I am or maybe we wait until the new year or a certain milestone in life to make big changes I've heard high school students say you know I'm going to start acting like a Christian once I get out of high school or once I finish college I'll start acting like a Christian Some people say, oh, I'll start going to church when we have kids. Or I'll start serving at church once those kids are out of the house or when we retire. But the time to start doing what ought to be done is right now. It's not waiting until a milestone or a day on the calendar. It's right now. And we know this. It's much easier said than done. And like a New Year's resolution, we recognize that things need to change in our life. But we lack what's needed to make these changes in our own power. In our attempt at sanctification, this Christian growth in holiness, what we need isn't simply more willpower or more effort. What we need is a supernatural transformation that can only come from God. We need to be made new. So last week, Jason excellently preached through 2 Corinthians 5.21, and he preached it at a level that even a child could grasp. And I don't mean that as an insult at all. Like, I'm not being funny. This is a high compliment. If somebody can communicate deep theological truths in a way that a child can understand, like, they are a truly excellent teacher. Jason did that last week, but Emily Higgins is in the back doing that right now, faithfully teaching our little ones every single week. And there's other volunteers back there too, people that are just like you that are doing this every single week. Like, walk back there, even if you parked over here today, walk back there and see what they're doing. Get here early and watch them singing songs and praising the Lord. Like, this is an essential ministry that they're doing and that they would love your help with. I've heard them say it. They would love more help with this. So go talk to Emily or talk to Jason or talk to me, and we can get you connected. So that little side rant over. I wasn't being paid extra for that. But as I was saying, Jason uh, very clearly explained the gospel last week through 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, for our sake, God the Father put our sin upon his perfect, sinless son, Jesus, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And today, I'm wanting us to really focus and uh, look at just a few verses before that, going back to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I think, yeah, 5, 17. There we go, perfect. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is such a beautiful 
refreshing implication of the gospel. Like the old has passed away, the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ. You don't remain the same. You aren't just a better version of yourself. You are a new creation, a new creature. That old person that you were is dead. Galatians 2.20, sorry. Sometimes I I see some of y'all and I just think about your story and your life and like this becomes so real. You know, it's, it's more than just words on a page. It's people's lives. So Galatians 2.20, Paul speaks of this firsthand experience with this, and he says that I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, or Christ who lives in you. So that old you, that naturally sinful you, that person that you hate, that person full of sin and shame, that person is dead through faith in Christ. That simple nat- that sinful nature of yours didn't like just simply die off on its own, though. It didn't starve away slowly. It didn't just dissipate and disappear. It didn't die a peaceful death. That old you was violently killed on the cross where Jesus took your place. Jesus was the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb who took our sins and placed them upon himself. But because Jesus took our place on the cross, because he was our representative, through faith we have received his righteousness and we have received new life. Through faith we are a new creation. The old has passed away. The old was crucified. Behold, the new has come. And so in Christ, you are actually a new person. You've been given a new heart. A new spirit has been put inside of you. And this is not contingent upon your abilities or your performance. This is not like your New Year's resolution where you tried really, really hard just to find out that you're the same person you were last year. The same donut eater you were yesterday. You aren't given just a little extra willpower and a little extra strength and left to yourself to make yourself new. Like in Christ, you are actually entirely new, not because of anything you have done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Because of his perfection, you are made new. In the book of John, it mentions a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And he was a ruler of the Jews. And when I was growing up, I remember thinking of the Pharisees in very like veggie tale kind of language. Pharisees were the bad guys, and Jesus and his disciples were the good guys, very black and white. And Jesus spoke harshly against the Pharisees on many occasions. And so this makes sense. We even use this word Pharisee like in in secular, popular speech. To describe somebody who's like a hypocrite or somebody who is overly judgmental. They're a Pharisee. But Pharisees were a little more nuanced than that. Pharisees were this Jewish group that was obsessed with personal holiness through keeping of the Old Testament law. Ryan's an expert in his studies of the Pharisees. He preached about them a couple weeks ago, did an excellent job. If you have any questions about Pharisees, ask Ryan. Not because he is one, but because he studied them. (laughs) But they were obsessed with holiness. And so they followed the Torah. But, like, we, we would say that they missed the heart behind the letter of the law. They're really good about keeping the 611 or 613 commandments of the the Torah but they missed the heart behind it. They were so obsessed with outward perfection that they even created and followed these like extra laws, this oral tradition. And they were people who were trying their very hardest 
to be good followers of God and to earn their salvation. If the Pharisees made New Year's resolutions, they would have been that category that's running the marathon and that's learning languages and that's losing 100 pounds and they only weigh 50 pounds. You know, that, that's who the Pharisees were. They're these people who are going over and above for their way of life, for the way uh, that they're trying to keep the standards. They're adding extra things that aren't even a, attainable for most people. They thought that they could earn their salvation through good deeds. And so there were serious flaws in their way of life, but we might be able to at least appreciate their desire to follow God's law and their desire for holiness, even if it was only outwardly. They weren't just like these bad guys running around like, like you know, jumping people and stealing goats and things like that. They were, they were outwardly, you know, appeared good, appeared clean. And so Nicodemus is one of these guys, and he approaches Jesus, and he begins questioning what he had been taught as a Pharisee. In John 3, 2, Nicodemus says to Jesus, says, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, Jesus, will have eternal life. So if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away because you were crucified with Christ, and behold, the new has come because you've been born again. This is what he tells Nicodemus, and this applies to us too. No, Nicodemus, it's not based on your life. It's based on the Son of Man. It's based on Jesus' life. All of this is through faith in Jesus Christ, not through our own works, not through our own effort or holiness or purity or attempt at any of that. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone that you are a new creation. As reading a a Bible dictionary, not the whole thing, that's not my New Year's resolution, just on this passage. And it was talking about this Greek word there that's used for creation. And it said that it was that which is exclusively God's work. The creation there. You're a new creation. You're exclusively God's work. And I love that definition because it contains different aspects of what it means to be a new creation. And sometimes, like, we read things or we see things that are, like, really obvious and we know them. And we just kind of, yeah, yeah, I know that. Maybe you, you sing the songs and you sing the lyrics and your mind is somewhere else. But then whenever you stop and you really let it sink in and you stop and you really think about what's being said, you're like, wow, that's actually, you know, pretty profound. That's actually pretty deep. And so I, I kind of had one of those moments where it's like, yeah, this is really straightforward. This is really simple, but it's actually pretty deep because in Christ, we are made new exclusively by God. Well, like, yeah, of course, that's, that's great and all, but like, it's God who is making us new. We aren't making ourselves new. God is the one who makes us new. And if God is doing something, do you think he can do anything like mess anything up? Like if God is the one doing it, do you think he could make a mistake while he's doing that? Like if God is doing something, you know it's being done perfectly. That's a comfort to me. If I'm making myself new, I've, I've already made the mistake of thinking that I could do that. And so we're made new. We are a new creation. We're exclusively God's work. So we're exclusively made by God, exclusively for God. And it, obviously, like, again, like, it's so simple, it's so straightforward, like, yeah, we're made for God, but, like, no, God has, like, designed you for a purpose, and that purpose is for Him, like, for this relationship with Him, to glorify Him, to live in communion with Him. That is what you're designed for. And when we do anything other than that, we're missing our purpose, We're missing what we've been made new for, what we've been created new for. We've been set 
apart from all other masters and idols. We are exclusively His. We are His possession. His keepsake. It's like, I just have to let that sink in. This is amazing grace that God would reconcile us to Himself through Christ, apart from anything we have done or could do. That doesn't make any sense in my mind. Like, that's just something that I have to let rest in my heart. Jonathan Edwards, who was a a famous 18th century pastor, he said something along similar lines. He said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. He's saying we were enemies of God. We were sinners who nailed the perfect Savior to a cross because of our sin. And yet God has brought us into a pleasure-filled relationship with Him through the life and the death and the resurrection of His own Son. Like, I feel like I preach on this every single time I preach, and I don't care, because I'm so amazed by God's plan of salvation. And like, I do my best to articulate it, but there's not words that can fully illustrate this magnitude and this beauty of God's grace and His love and His glory that's on display through, through Jesus' death on the cross. Like, we sing songs to Him to try to magnify Him, and we're not magnifying Him like a, a, a microscope making something really small appear big. We are magnifying him like a telescope, making his greatness just come into perspective. I'm just blown away by who he is and what he's done. And the thing is, we, we sing our hearts out to God because of what he's done. And we work our hardest because of what he's done. And we love others sacrificially because of what he's done. We worship him because of what he's done in gratitude and adoration for what he has done. We don't praise him to earn his grace or his love. We praise him because we are in awe that he has already given us his grace and his love through giving us his only son in spite of our sins, in spite of ourselves. We praise Him because all this is from God. 2 Corinthians 5.19 In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Again, this should fill us with wonder. All this is from God. We sinned against God, and yet God placed our sins on Jesus and gave us his righteousness instead. Like he looks at us just as if we had never sinned and he makes us new, a new creation. And I think some people might misunderstand what's being said here. Some people think of this as like being a clean slate. Like the start of a new year. Like you're saved and you're made new and your sin is put on Jesus. And now you're just counting down the number of days without sin. And you're perfect until you're not. And you're perfect until you sin. And then you're filled with this weight and this guilt and this shame. It's like January 1st. You're counting down the number of days you've gone without eating chocolate or drinking a soda. And there's this cloud of looming shame right over you, waiting to rain down on you when you slip up and you eat that Dr. that Twix or that drink that Dr. Pepper. And the more days you went without eating that chocolate or without drinking that soda, it almost compounds the guilt and the shame you feel. Like, I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. I made it 360 days without chocolate, and then I messed up. Or maybe... You say, I'm not drinking another soda this new year. And y'all are sitting there watching the clock count down. Three, two, one, happy new year. And then you grab that Dr. Pepper and you just chugged it. And you're like, oh, again. Oh, I'm so stupid. I can't even make it 
30 seconds without a soda. I thought things were really going to be different this year. And so similarly, you have this weight of guilt and shame upon you. There's a shame of messing up after doing so good for so long. And there's a shame of messing up from messing up nearly as soon as you start. And in both cases, there's the shame of being imperfect. However, this is not what it means to be made new in Christ. When we're made new, when God regenerates us, when he gives us a new heart and puts our sin upon Jesus, we are clothed in his righteousness. We are wearing a robe that is unable to be stained. It's not like a whiteboard that's been wiped clean and then there's more marks getting made every time you sin. No, you are wearing His righteousness. Our sins don't stick to this robe because all of our sins, past and future, have been nailed to Jesus Christ on the cross. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. This is what God says. There's no more shame for those who have been made new in Christ. You are a new creation now and forever. And if you're sitting here and you haven't, or you have considered placing a life-changing trust in Jesus, but you keep putting it off. Don't wait until 2023. Don't wait till your kids are out of the house or after that cruise that you've planned or once you're done with school. Don't wait until you leave this building. Like now is the time to place a life-changing faith in Jesus for your salvation. Now is the time for him to make you a new creation. And maybe you want to be made new. Maybe you feel like you just got to improve yourself first, though. You feel like you've got to get better in some areas before you can place your trust in him. Like you've got to deal with a few sins before Jesus will take you. But Jesus is calling you to himself just as you are. And he is the one who makes you new. Maybe you feel like you can't be made new because of all the things you've done. Maybe you feel this weight of shame or this guilt upon you. And so you've given up, you've become complacent, you've become numb, and you've stopped trying altogether. Maybe you feel hopeless. Jesus is calling you to himself as well. He will make you new. His grace is more than sufficient. If you have been made new by Jesus, but you've been struggling with the same sins over and over, and you try your hardest, but you keep falling short, or you're filled with shame and guilt, if this is you, you need to be reminded that you have already been made new. You need to rest in what Jesus has already done for you. Jesus has already taken your sin and shame. You are a new creation, and you did nothing to make that happen. All this is from God. You are his and you are not alone. But you've been given the Holy Spirit who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Quit trying to fix yourself in your own strength, in your own power, and rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and the confidence that we have in the salvation that he earned for us and freely gave us. Jesus declares his children righteous apart from anything they have done. And a heart-changing understanding of this will bring about holiness. Not out of an obligation or a fear or an attempt to earn salvation, but out of a love and a gratitude that God has so graciously saved us and made us new. Out of worship. Grant, y'all can come on up here. So maybe this uh, week you made a resolution to lose weight. 
or eat better or read more books or learn five languages. Like, that's great. I'm not discouraging you from any of those goals. Those are great things. But if you truly want to be made new, trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's not going to come from yourself. It's going to come from him. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and continue in worship. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you just give us an overwhelming sense of what you've done for us, a uh, knowledge of your work and your grace that uh, goes deeper than just our minds, but transforms our hearts, that transforms us as people, that we are uh, filled with in awe of you. Heavenly Father, make us new in Jesus Christ. Amen.